I'm Meg Mott, and this is the final in the series of Good Clash. And people have been asking for the last five weeks, when will we get to practice this? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I can't always see everybody, and I know that sometimes people have been raising their hands, but the, the light, I, some people are in the darkness. So um, if you want to um, join in the conversation, and I love it when people ask questions, I love it when people disagree. I love it when people object um, for some good clash. So if I'm not noticing you because you are in the shadows, just say Meg or beep, beep or whatever to get my attention so that uh, we can get your voice into the mix. So you may have noticed a big change today. No screen. Yes, we are liberated from the PowerPoint. Uh, we are going back to 20th century ways of organizing public presentations, which is flip charts, magic markers, and props. Um, and I, I, I needed PowerPoint, perhaps, I don't actually, you could convince me to run this whole thing without PowerPoint, I'd be very interested in that, but I've come to rely on it just because it keeps me somewhat organized and then I move down the path that I thought might be a good path to move down on. Um, all bets are off today. <laughs> Where will I go? Where will we go? Who knows? I do have an agenda. I learned this. Um, I think Joan Hamilton, I always do a little shout out from, for Joan, because uh, Joan Hamilton was somebody who I did the AIDS training with, AIDS project training, and um, Lynn Martin was also involved in that, maybe some others of you. And there was always an agenda. I found that very comforting that there would be an agenda, we would be getting involved in something really big, dealing with loss, dealing with grief, dealing with stigma, and there would be the agenda. And that was just what I needed. So we do have an agenda. Um, and oh, we've already gotten into the first part, which is democracy is a game, which means we get to play. And this can be a very helpful attitude, especially if you're suffering from this, not wanting to hear. We've been talking about all you need to do is take your hands down. But something we haven't talked about much, although it did show up a little bit, is this. Which is oftentimes shame. Speaking in public can be shame inducing. Particularly if you feel like something you said gets grabbed and then taken out of context. Those machines do that reliably. So this is also, if, you, if it's a game, then the shame can go away. It's like, oh yeah, it was hard. I made a mistake, but uh, it's okay. I can deal with this. Now we're gonna play again. The other nice thing about thinking about it in terms of a game is that um, unlike conflict where we shoot each other, uh, we can't play another round. So I really like deliberation. We, and this is something Shoshana brought up on, in the very first class, and I didn't answer her question well. I was trying to postpone it. She had already figured out what the whole point was. And it was um, about, we do not live in a dictatorship. Yeah. When we deliberate, we keep going. So even though a Supreme Court may make a decision, and we've seen this all the time, right? Uh, the Supreme Court makes a decision. Maybe we love the decision. And then we watch how the deliberation keeps going. So um, the point of deliberation, and uh, when we were talking about Hobbes, he said it's a loss of liberty. And Shoshana said, we don't live in a dictatorship, although maybe that's what Hobbes wanted. She may have a point. I like to disagree. Uh, but that when we deliberate, the game isn't over unless we've killed each other or treated each other as if we didn't mean anything, which is another way of doing civil death. Um, so one of the things I like about the game playing is that it might get us a sense of, okay, we lost that round, but we're going to go at it again. Because the point is the clash. The point is to keep deliberating and seeing what's going to happen. Um, is Bob here? Are you Bob? I am Bob. I think you are Bob, the Bob. You are the Bob who said, when I asked, what is, like, what is, what is the whole point of doing this? Like, what is the good? And you said it is, it is to be able to speak here in public and not feel frightened for speaking. 
And I just, and that was also in the first class. And I just really wanted to reinforce that. That as much as we're able to play the game and feel like we can speak in public, this game is going to go just fine. Uh, so we are going to, right, a little bit, there's going to be a step-by-step -step moving towards deliberation. You can see I have some seats here. However, this is not going to be random. I will not force anybody to do anything they do not wish to do. And we'll be doing some preliminary work in small groups to build these capacities to eventually get here. But I have a, a test first, because this is the last class. Let's see. Isn't this an amazing stage? Yeah, come see this show. It's called The Dear Edwina Show. It's Friday at 7, I think. Saturday matinee, 2, and Saturday evening at 7. Um, and it's a great show. And it's a great show, says Peter Amidon. Okay. Um, so if the first one is a giveaway, because I won't ask you to name who wrote it. But I, there was a question that came up, which is, what is liberal? Somebody over there asked that. I don't know if it was Bob. Uh, somebody over, who usually sits over here wanted to know, you say the term liberal, and what does that mean? Because even that term is contested. And if everything is contested, then how can we go forward? Well, I found a very broad definition of liberal, and I wanted to offer it to all of you. Uh, this is by Edmund Fawcett not an old guy, somebody who's still alive. I know I don't usually read from people who are still alive, but I like this, so I let him on the show. Um, usually it's reserved for dead people. Um, liberal is a search for an ethically acceptable order of human progress among civic equals without recourse to undue power. I'm going to read it again, yes. A search for, this is the problem of no PowerPoint. <laughs> However, isn't it nicer in some ways not yes. to have the screen? Good. Myra, I'm going to take that as a big vote, yes. <laughs> a search for an ethically acceptable order of human progress. So an idea of progress is going to be important. We're looking forward. How can we be better? It's ethical in the sense as we are framing norms coming up with ways to live, which we may then debate and say that norm isn't functional anymore, but we're engaging on that level of trying to create norms that uh, move us forward among civic equals, so that's us, civic equals, without recourse to undue power. So no coercive force. I am not going to force anyone to come up and sit in these chairs. If you do not wish to do that, you can do all other parts of this long exercise we're going to do, but you don't need to, to do that, because this is what liberal looks like. And I want to say strongly that that thing hanging from the clouds over there, the Constitution, is a liberal document. It is we the people, that civic equals, it is doing everything in its power to separate uh, factions, to separate power itself. Uh, that's the federal understanding. And um, there are constraints on all branches of government. And there are constraints on all government against taking away our liberties. Now, we have to hold on to these liberties. That's the big challenge. But this, is, I would say, liberal is a term that applies to the Constitution. Oh, and if we were wondering what our game's rules were, that's the rules of the game. Okay, so here's your first question. Uh, this is, can you guess who said this? If the people are not utterly degraded, although individually they may be worse judges than those who have special knowledge, as a body, they are as good or better. Anybody? Who said that? Oh, no, he's got to be dead. Uh, Madison is dead, yes. Who, who said that? What, Larry? Not Machiavelli. Plato. Close, very close, same time period. No, 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 the, Aristotle. Myra's got it. Myra won that. 
Okay. Um, you ready for another one? Okay. The emancipation. You didn't do very well on the first. I just. But I think we can get better. I do think we can get better. Can everybody over there see me? All right. Yeah. And I know that you all are sometimes cast in the shadows. So, if you if you if I'm not seeing your hand, or you can just shout out the answer, um, and I will not make too nasty a noise if you're wrong. The emancipation of one group has to be inclusive of another group, or it will encounter many failures, cruelties, and reactions. Yeah, it is that woman. Who is it? Jane Adams. Yes, very good. Who got that? Nancy? Mary Alice? And Julie. Mary Alice and Julie. Nice. Okay. Whee! All right, this is a tough one. Hate is increased by being returned, but can be destroyed by love. He who imagines he is loved by one he hates will be torn by hate and love together. Does anybody remember? Gandhi. Yes, yeah, like Gandhi, but was, Gandhi didn't show up on our screen. Remember those beautiful eyes? Spinoza. Absolutely, Spinoza. That's it. So important. Um, and, and these things that I'm reading out, these are going to be part of our ground rules, right? Hate can be destroyed by love. Um, remember to look for the, the wisdom in the other branch. OK. Here's another one. Every opinion ought to be considered precious with whatever amount of error and confusion that truth may be blended. Mm. Who said that? What did you say? Mm, no, no, no. It wasn't just last week, people. It was also the first week. And I think it was said on the second week. And then it was said again on the fifth week. This one I had high hopes for. No, do you want me to read it one more time? OK, here's a, who, which guy, that's a hint. Oh, oh, it turns out most of them are guys. Anyway, which guy really made this strong point? Every opinion ought to be considered precious. In fact, Janice says, what is this precious? With whatever amount of error and confusion, that truth may be blended. And Sheldon, you spent a lot of time like, trying to figure out what is the truth? What, what does that mean? Is it an in-between point? Or maybe it was Bob. I don't know. So who said that? Uh. No. <laughs> no. Mel. Mel, OK, Mel, this is very good. It was, a, it was a noble effort. And this, you know, I know, Mary Alice, you can just do that for a little bit. And then you come out. Try the next one. Uh, OK, this is a trick one. Yeah, this is, a, this is a trick one. When the mind considers itself and its power of acting, it rejoices. Only a trick, because we've already said that name. When, when the mind considers itself and its power of acting, it rejoices. No, it's somebody you've already said, Larry. It's obviously Spinoza. How did you know that? Who said that? That was Alison Mott who said that. I wonder how she knew that. Alison Mott. Oh my goodness, how did you know that, Alison Mott? Wow. OK, and now here's the one. Larry, you can, you can hold your answer. It's good government arises from good education. Good education from good laws. And good laws from those clashes which so many rashly condemn. Who said that? Machiavelli. Machiavelli. That's, this is our guy. This is what we're doing the whole thing. Um, and then I did want to read you somebody who we didn't use at all. And if I run this again and I have more weeks, I definitely would put this guy in my playlist. Uh, and this is of equality. As if it harmed me, giving others the same chances and rights as myself. As if it were not indispensable to my own rights that others possess the same. Anybody knows who said that? Oh, I like that. Let's have, and we could put that in like a picture and put that in our heads and then our little brains go. But that could be a good thing. 
again. Okay, of equality. As if it harmed me, giving others the same chances and rights as myself. As if it were not indispensable to my own rights that others possess the same. Isn't that a good one? So dead. So dead. So dreamy. Okay, there is a hint. Um, wait, is there a hint? Oh, yeah, there is a hint. I did put it down because we're going to spend a little bit more time on this whole idea. Um, we'll see. Like, uh, I, this is a opening up for Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman. Exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, boy, does he nail a lot of this. Okay, so we'll put these away. Um, anybody see any mistakes up here, given that that was another thing that we spent a lot of time on? Like, Mary Alice, I gave you a hard time about Hobbes, but I made a mistake. I was just yeah, well, it's worth, it's always worth, like, just shoot it out there. See what happens. Yes, I knew. Okay, so anyway, you remember our little guy? Stay with the mistake. I just thought, do, 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 do. We can fix our mistakes. Just do that, it's gone. Um, I hope we can bring that kind of attitude to all our political discussions. Did I make a mistake now? Oh, it's because ad hominem is plural. And so I added an S. And so the Latin scholars came in and said, ah, I don't think you need that S. So anyway, we got rid of it. I should probably underline ad hominem as well. Yes. Um, but so, okay, are you ready? I set out some ground rules, and this is before we go into deliberation, one of the things we're going to want to consider, um, and let me tell you what the whole thing is going to look like. So first of all, we're going to go over the ground rules. Then I'm going to show you a framing question, and I call them framing questions because an actual a fair amount of effort needs to go into figuring out what is going to be deliberated. Deliberation always falls down when people have completely different understandings of what it is that is under discussion. I am using current topics that our uh, state legislatures are focusing on for the first one. So we're going to look at New Hampshire's, uh, sorry, we're going to look at Vermont's 24-hour waiting period for handguns. Uh, and, the, and the advantage for, at least this is my argument, the advantage to try and tying it to a specific piece of le legislation is it narrows the debate. All of a sudden you begin to, both people on two, si on two sides of the argument will have a clearer sense of something very specific. When it, a bad clash is usually something monumental, such as abortions, right or wrong, or guns, right or wrong. Uh, as we talked about Jill Lepore, I thought that was so insightful how she said, guns, abortion, turn into murder if you're for it, or if you're, if you're on the left for one, it's murder. If you're on the right for the same one, it's freedom. If you're on the right for one, it's murder. Am I saying this right? And if you're on the opposite, it's freedom. So when we get to those large, large terms, those are very, very hard to deliberate. If there's a way to bring it down to something far more specific, that can uh, create a bit of a boundary. That isn't to say get rid of terms like liberty or freedom, because those are going to be key. Yes, Edie. If you have 24 hours and he's already got a gun, who's going to enforce it? So Edie, this is so perfect. You see, you are ready to go. And this is going to be the next step, is, is exactly as you're going to be making those sort of arguments. So thank you, Edie. She just gave us an example of what the next step will be, which will be to talk to the person next to you or two people next to you. And just as for the last two classes, come up with, I'm not saying seven, two plausible arguments. So don't take, you know, sometimes we have two things and then we say, well, that's actually the same thing. So you need to find two plausible arguments on one side and two plausible arguments on the opposing side. So that's going to be the, the next thing you do. And then the, so the small groups will have seven minutes to figure all that out. And then 
we volunteers will come up. So you won't come up here by yourself. A, a group of two will come here. A group of two will come, sit there. I will reach into my pocket. I will pull out a coin. We will flip the coin. And if you're uh, heads, then you will argue in favor. And if you're tails, you'll argue against. And, and we will also turn off the cameras at that point. Because <laughs> when we get to the ground rules, that's was a key piece. Because um, this is, will be online. and. It's not a good idea to um, engage in deliberation in front of cameras in this time where people just snatch, snatch, and snatch, and then reframe. Um, so that's what that's going to look like. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to do two of these. But before we get started, even in our small groups, I wanted to go over the ground rules. And this we got from the Public Conversations Project in Boston. Uh, the groups of, I think they were all women. Some were pro-life, some were pro-choice. The terrible shootings had taken place, and they wanted to come together and stop the shooting. So I have just pretty much verbatim written down what the ground rules that they established. So this is going to be a key first one in talking about um, if the first one has to do with the waiting period around guns. How are you going to be talking about guns? And when you're thinking about your plausible arguments on both sides, just watch as you're creating those that you're not using terms that would uh, escalate the dissent. The, make it turn it into a weird clash as opposed to a good clash. This one seems pretty obvious. Yes, Bob. For those of us who are challenged, would you, uh, in terms of our vision? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So the, thank you, Bob. So the first one. Yeah, use acceptable terms. No red flag words. No red flag words. That's a great way to say that. Um, do not interrupt, grandstand, or here's my mistake. Use ad hominems. So what's an ad hominem? Janice. Well, it means the argument's directed towards uh, to the person. Yes. The man, but you're arguing towards you take it personally. Taking it personally, it's usually a personal attack. Um, I'm sure, is there somebody in here who can mean, does it mean attacking the person ad hominem, attacking the man, right? Am I, I don't know Latin, I'm sorry. Um, so that, yeah, you, you don't want to engage in that sort of activity. This one is a big one, speak independently. Not as part of an organization, and I'm putting that in parentheses, faction, because we did talk about those. That is becoming increasingly hard as people tend to say something like, well, as a member of, you know, so as a, as a lesbian from Wyndham County da, 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 who raises goats, I can say this. Um, and, and I, for, th for this reason, I think that can become problematic. That rather just to say, for myself, this is what I see. And to not ascribe, because of you're a part of an identity group, you can only make these kind of arguments. That's also true for joining an organization. And this, again, may feel rather um, controversial. When somebody says something like, as a member of the NRA, or as a member of the Black Panthers, or as a member of even Black Lives Matter, or as a member of whatever the organization is, and there's a lot of great organizations out there. I'm all for social movements. They can be incredibly effective but they don't necessarily give us the opportunity to think it out together because it just becomes faction against faction. And then this other one is to, to speak away from cameras. So we will turn off the cameras when we're doing this part. <coughs> is there anything we wanted to add? I know Nancy last time said um, early on to be civil. I think you said that in the first class. Yes, you said, uh, didn't you, Nancy? I think it was Nancy, who said, uh, you know, like, don't swear. Don't use, like, use, I, that's what I remember. You have no memory? I'm happy to take the credit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I know, that, again, this is contested, but to speak like civil discourse. Because we're civic equals. Yes, Peter. Uh, uh, Listen deeply without figuring out what you're going to say. Yeah. Way to say that. Mm. Listen deeply. Yeah. 
Yes, that. Uh, Scientific America has an article on how to make arguments for and up against climate change. And one of the things they simply say is close to all of the things you're saying, which is to validate the person. In other words, you say, I hear you. Yes, right. So maybe I'm going to put that around here. I hear you. It's, it's the antithesis of ad hominem. It's the antithesis of this. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Susan. Is that Susan? Yeah. Um, providing opportunity, excuse me, for non confrontational requests for clarification. Ah, yes. And can I, can I write that down as ask questions? Like, or. But also, um, it's not an attack. It's, I'm not sure I got what you meant. Can you say that another way? Yeah. Yeah. Can you say that another way? Oops, I think I get feedback here. Yeah. Um, does that give us enough? Janice, did you want to add something? Um, I've been reading recently, or I think I heard it on Being, um, the concept of listening generously, mm. which is a little different, particularly is a difficult concept, I think, to really get. Um, generously implies an openness. Yes. Yeah, so I'm adding, Janice said, um, deeply gets at some of it, but then generously is another adverb that for her is very useful. Um, so are we ready to try this? So here's our framing question. And we're going to work on creating a second one. But for this first run through, should Vermont pass a 24 hour waiting period bill on handguns, because that's what the uh, state house is, is considering right now. And uh, let's see, I, is it going to work for twos if we just go down? So we have two, two, right? you see how this could work? Um, and it looks like maybe you'll be talking to somebody you know very well, but maybe you'll also be talking to somebody you don't know that well. That could be great. Uh, we're only going to take five or six minutes. And your job is to find plausible arguments, at least two, that are for, yes, Vermont should, and arguments against. And if you f feel like, oh, OK, I, didn't even, I missed that class completely, maybe the other person you're talking to will. Uh, is, does anybody know about this bill? It's the last of a series of bills that is going through the state legislature. Um, anybody maybe? Questions or that? Did you want to ask a I question? Just wanted to, for those that don't know what the reason is, because not everybody can follow everything that's going on, is the reason is, is that people want to pass this bill so that people are less likely to commit suicide. Right. They came from a family who had a 20 year old child who committed suicide and right. they wanted to do that. Great. Thank you. Right. Because that's, and that's the way they were framing it too. Uh, thank you. Okay, are we ready to give this a try? And just because you talk to the person next to you doesn't necessarily mean you'll end up on stage. All right. got there. Every, every group has two arguments, plausible arguments on both sides. Okay. I know it's tough. And, this, and we're going to do a slightly tougher one for the next one. Um, all righty. Now, here's the fun part. Um, 
Does, does anybody know Forum Theater? Augusto Boal Forum Theater. Uh, this is something that came out of Paulo Freire, and, and, uh, a Brazilian educator, who came up with ways. How do you build uh, deliberation from the bottom up? So Augusto Boal was a, um, he was somebody who was involved in theater, and then he ran for the legislature in Brazil. And he took all his theater knowledge and brought it to the legislative process. So when the Brazilian legislature, for a while, I don't know if they're still doing this, but for a while, when they had a big policy, they would act it out. And they took all the different sides and they, they created real drama. So um, uh, one what had to do with passing domestic violence laws, I gather, from what I've read. And uh, they would play out these scenarios. And then through playing out the scenarios, they began to see, well, what could be useful state intervention? Uh, and it seems like a great way to do a little deliberative democracy. Uh, the other thing he came up with is something called forum theater, and that's where we have these chairs like this. So um, there'll be this group here, and this is going to be the yes chairs. And we'll have these chairs over here, and these are going to be the no chairs. And we're going to let these two groups play it out for just a little bit so they get their arguments out there. And then there's another group that may say, well, wait a minute. Now that I know what they've said, and I heard what they said, I actually think I could do a better job in this group. And so then that group switches out. And then that group goes at this group. And then people watch it and say, oh, wait a minute. This group could have done a better job. I have a good rebuttal. And so another group comes in here. So we do this little round robin piece. This is, uh, I, I like to do debate at Marlboro. And this is a, a fun way to sort of get people going with the debate. So um, when you start, you, you won't necessarily stay here for very long, because other people may want to take your seat and make other points. That's just the way human beings are. We're a slightly competitive, ambitious lot. So I think this, we'll start to see this happen. Is there a group that's willing? Well, let me, yeah, is, I need four volunteers, which means two groups. Do I have a group that's willing to start? It's fun up here. <laughs> Any tap dancers want to come? Yeah? OK. I, I'm looking for some volunteers. I know, yes! OK. OK, would you guys just come forward? We don't know if you're yes or no yet. Yes, you're going to come forward. And who's your partner, Spoon? Great, you're coming too. Well, I didn't know I was Let me make sure it's OK. Are you willing to travel with Spoon? Well, we never had a conclusion yet. OK, it's up to your partner. Are you ready to come up? Does that mean like you might? Or maybe you want to wait? What? No, she doesn't want to. OK. I appreciate, though, the enthusiasm and the civic equality that just got worked out. I want to just give that a, a hand, round of applause. Absolutely. Do we have another two people? Oh, yes, I see people going like this. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. No? It's going to be so much fun. Oh, Allison Mott and Peter Aragon. <laughs> This is a big deal, Allison Mott is here today. And now she's coming all the way to the stage. That's so great. OK, so um, let's see. Um, what did I say? Do you, what do you want to pick? You, you pick for us. OK, so, yeah, it, so all right, I'm going to do it for them. OK, so we're figuring out whether you're f uh, pro or con. What does it say? Pro, heads. OK, that means you guys are con. Okay. All right, so the pros are here. And the cons are there. Excellent. And the question is, should Vermont pass a 24-hour waiting period before purchasing, sorry for that um, vague moment, uh, bill on handguns? And we're going to begin with the affirmative. Okay, um, so that was very exciting. Uh, Linda, when she was coming in, said, um, you've generated a lot of enthusiasm. 
And um, I felt that enthusiasm. We all felt that enthusiasm. Where do you think it came from? I mean, what did you, what was this process, right? We have our brave first four, the two Allison Peter duo and the Peg Joel duo. We had the brave people coming forward. What was your like, feeling at that point? A little nervous, maybe nobody would show up? Uh -huh. Yes, Marion. I, I was surprised that there wasn't reference to the Constitution. Oh, Marion, I love you. She was wondering when would there be some reference to the Constitution. And there was a bit of a, a reference to the Constitution. Yes, like who gave us some references? A bit, not, not saying the word, no, <laughs> but alluding to it. Anybody? Yes, Judy? Well, somebody alluded to taking away rights and liberties. Right, when Spoon was talking, there was a sense of like rights and liberties would be taken away. Absolutely, yeah, Philip? I found it very energizing to force myself to think of logical, reasonable, charitable reasons on the other side. Yes, yes. And did that, did, you gen did that generate enthusiasm for you? Yes, well, for me, it, 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 it took me to a place I've not felt that way. Oh. When I think the other side. Yes. Right. Uh, did everybody hear what Philip said? It took him to a place that he normally would not have felt about the other side. Just to come up with the argument, you get a little dopamine hit or something of that sort. It's like, ooh, that's a good one. Lynn, Lynn, you, you had something. I like the idea of the ladies and gentlemen. What you think changed? Why did you? So Lynn says, I'll make sure I repeat. So Lynn says that it was so great to have an opportunity to talk to the person next to them. And, and that is definitely, I think there's others who are feeling that, that the next time I do this, and I'm hoping to take this on the road, is that to give these opportunities for people to have these exchanges. And so it doesn't have to be quite so public, right? But to have the, that conversation. Other moments of enthusiasm, or where you felt like, oh, I'm feeling even more excited. Yes, uh, can you? Everybody wants to be heard in a safe place. Yes, and can you tell us your name? Susan. Susan, I for, sorry, I forgot. Susan is saying how important it is to feel like you can be heard in a safe place. And what's fun about this game is you can be heard about something that maybe you wouldn't actually want to go out and protest about. But you could still be heard playing a role. Yeah, uh, Janice. I particularly liked the chafing. Yeah, like since you know that right. was really they would be hers. You know. So Janice is saying she really liked it when. when so what happened? Was it somebody switched over? Steve moved over, or, or somebody, or or was it just when anybody moved over? Yeah, one of them. Scott moved to defend. Scott moved to defend Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yes. Yes, right, exactly. Who, who, what did you say, Scott? I, I was switched in twice. You, were, you yeah. kept moving around. <laughs> and, that, and was that an enthusiasm feeling yes. thing? Yes, yeah. yeah. Like, like, okay, there's these positions, but we move around in the positions. We're not chained to the position. Ah! No, we get to move all around. Uh, Shoshana, you had your hand no, up? No, I was going to say what Janice said. Yeah. Yes, and Janice has another point. Yes. No question. I'm curious if you can bring this to the U.S. Congress. So Janice wants to know if this show should go to the U.S. Congress. <laughs> yes. Maybe we can start in Vermont and go other places, right? Go to the Vermont legislature and then go to New Hampshire and to try this activity. Um, yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Leanne. Leanne. Um, talking about the format yeah. of what was here. When there are people up there having conversation, uh -huh. I think it takes a lot of the weight off the audience as far as feeling kind of like, instead of a one-on-one -on -one thing, yes. I could feel much more comfortable participating in it, knowing that there was diffusion of many other people on yeah. the stage. So Leanne's point, and did everybody hear this, like when you have these multiple seats, and that the people are going, are talking to each other, that that feels like, uh, you, you felt, Leanne, like you were more able to engage. Definitely. Whereas if it's PowerPoint, or if you have the, the, the professor up there talking and doing that, that's a totally different kind of feel. Exactly. Yeah, this is a way to democratize it. Yeah, and we have a hand in the back. Oh, that's Scott. In, in reference to can, can this road show be taken to, to <laughs> Congress, I think the, pro, the, the problem is that um, those in Congress are chained to their chairs yes. Yes. with money yes. and their yes. livelihoods yes. And, and their elections are dependent on finances 
and so they are chained to their position and they can't speak as we did. Right, right. I mean, that is such an important point. That, did everybody hear Scott about how the politicians are chained and there's money underneath the chair so they even have to, oh, I'm supposed to say this? Yeah, bad. Uh, I actually experienced a good clash because I actually talked to Gene White, who probably represents a heck of a lot of people, or <coughs> Senator, about this particular subject. And she explained to me that it could, the chances of any kind of this law going through was slim with 48 hours and, and uh, long guns being involved in this. So she said, this is what's going to get through. This is our compromise. Yeah. This, is, this is the only way we're going to get it through. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to live with it. So I was quoted in, what do you call it? Uh, uh, in Vermont Digger, right. basically doing what I shouldn't have done, which is what do these people don't get about compromise? We're trying to do it. So that, that alienates them, so they're not going to listen to you now. So, but, but that's, Pat is talking about this actual bill and how it went through committee and talking to Jeanette White about the compromise and the deliberation that happened. And sure, for all the reasons that were put over here, it was not a great bill, but this is the best bill they could do. Uh, so we got a sense of what that's like. Perfect segue, I, and I'm going to go rather metaphysical. We're not going to forget the enthusiasm because um, the enthusiasm is what, in my mind, makes metaphysics useful. It's like, oh no, really? I had all that enthusiasm and then I talked about metaphysics. But when you see where we're going, it actually can be very exciting. And I'm hoping, especially some of you who've talked to me aside about a sense of either despair about the current political situation or a sense of the factionalism is so strong, the animosity is so strong, it's very easy to feel terrified and have a sense of powerlessness. And, um, and, and how we understand power is going to have a lot to do with our sense of powerlessness. So I'm introducing metaphysics as a way to uh, reframe what power looks like and I'm hoping will give you enthusiasm that you can take elsewhere. So first I'm going to start with Aristotle's chain of being. And his went, although I don't, angels, that may be more of St. Thomas Aquinas. But at the very bottom, bottom, and that's not a negative thing, is our rocks, the natural world. And rocks have existence. And rocks have solidity and rocks take up space. It's an amazing power that rocks have. As we go up, we go a little further up and we hit plants. So Aristotle was always looking at the natural world and wanting to organize it. Here's a plant. It also has something to do with the generative process. Plants are amazing. Don't we know that living here? We look outside and those little sticky green leaves of spring start coming out and there's that sense of all new possibilities, all new power. So we had the rocks, we had winter, we had the solidity of the season and then we start to feel this starting to happen. I always get intoxicated this time of year. Driving? Oh, it's a bad thing. I know I'm in this rock of a car. Yes, we're using fossil fuels, but look at those leaves. It's just wild. Um, so we, as we keep going up, then we hit animals. Uh, OK, besides their sticky green leaves, I do want to say something else about plants. They seed themselves. They reseed. That, that means they are cause of themselves. And they feed themselves, or they you know, take the green from the, they take the sun and they feed themselves, or they pull up the water and they feed themselves. They go onto the rocks and they feed themselves. Aristotle was really interested in these liminal spaces. Uh, is an oyster a rock or a plant, he wondered? <laughs> or is it, a, or is it a, 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 an animal? He, oysters were very, very confusing to him because they just stay in one place or a barnacle. What is this thing? Uh, animals are able to move around. Now, I know there's some plants, I guess, who move, but locomotion 
It's another thing we get as we move up the chain of being. We're not leaving anything behind. The strength of existence, the ability to grow, to feed ourselves, to reseed. And now we've got this new thing. We can locomote all around. That's what animals can do. It's amazing just seeing them moving everywhere. Um, he puts humans above, but again, he's very interested in this liminal space. Uh, dolphins? for Aristotle, had more energy, more capacity than slaves. And when he's talking about slaves, he's talking about either people restricted because of they were prisoners of war, they became slaves, they had a debt, they became slaves in ancient Athens. I think if you served for office, unlike our politicians, you were chained, but you were not with any money. So some public officials had the legal capacity as a slave. And then he also said, very controversially, uh, and I tend to give Aristotle the benefit of the doubt, he's a lovely opponent, uh, he said that people who always want others to make their decisions for them are a type of slave. A citizen is somebody who rules and is ruled. If a decision is made, OK, I'll abide by it. But I can also deliberate against that decision. So ruling and being ruled was to be a citizen. A slave is somebody who always looked for somebody else to make their decisions. I so worry about these machines. People pull them out of their thing. And then they say, well, what should I do? Or where am I going? Or who am I talking to? There's an, look at this, even the submission in that thing. I worry about, I'm not the only one to say this, but a way in which we, funny thing, human beings, we give our power to something else. And then we bow down before it. So addiction, it's called screen addiction, or addiction to substances, is a way of bowing down, right, to this thing. Uh, and so a dolphin is a higher form of being, because they have more energy at their disposal. So that's how it works, going up. Um, again, I say, uh, this may be a medieval edition from St. Thomas Aquinas, who took this and gave it a Catholic piece. But the thing I like about angels is they have even more energy than human beings. And, um, and that is because, I don't know why this breaks my heart, is that they are able to see everything. This is a cumulative hierarchy. It's not a dominating hierarchy. It's a cumulative hierarchy. Angels are able to see us in ways that we can't always see ourselves. They see us in our patterns. They see us as a whole. And then God is, is able to see the whole thing. For Spinoza, who operates under the same chain of being scholastic worldview, God is substance. It's all of us. It's the plants, it's the animals, it's one substance, and here's the key piece that is able to reflect on itself. So when we all are doing our deliberations, and then we're looking back on what we just deliberated, and we are feeling the enthusiasm of the deliberation, and we're doing it all in our memories, in my mind, that's us moving up into this level. Reflecting on the whole, Seeing what just transpired, watching ourselves and our different feelings that we had. And that's, uh, for Spinoza, necessary for holding the whole thing. We are all of it. One big thing. We are the deliberation. We go back and forth. It's a very different way of understanding the world, but it gives me a great sense of like, oh, well, Spinoza, that was one of those cards. The mind that reflects on its capacity to act will rejoice. You can count on it. You could watch us moving, watching somebody change positions, finding a better argument. We think about that and we rejoice. Uh, so, yes. Talk about changing positions is not politically always acceptable in this country. Yeah, so, um, oops, I just, Nancy? Yes. 
Nancy just said how um, changing positions is not acceptable. To whom, Nancy? Well, uh, all right. I'm going to say yeah. the T word. The T word. Oh, OK. So switching positions, you know, um, we are, we might feel, OK, uh, the T word. Reference to the guy in the Oval Office. Yes, so, so how does that person fit into this? And are we only looking at that person? And, I'll, you know, and I'm not going to assume that everybody's unhappy with that person. Because um, I think there's going to be some people who feel like, wow, it was actually amazing that anybody changed the tax code. They thought that couldn't be done. That was kind of amazing. That could happen. It was an action that happened. May not be happy with the results, but there was an action that actually happened. Uh, criminal justice reform. An action did happen. It was like, wow, didn't think that could even happen. If we're thinking about in terms of actions, capacity to act, capacity to make things happen, then that might, we might think that that office is way up high here. But there's another place where that capacity to act turns into everything we talked about here. So many people over here. OK, try and enforce that. Uh, is that just, uh, is that really going to actually be something? Um, somebody said that over here, right, in the con position. We may think that somebody has enormous amounts of power and therefore they're up here. I'm not so sure. I think that that position is actually pretty low now. If we can see our own power to act in opposition to it, I think what we are afraid of is that we can't actually act. And that's different than seeing somebody else acting in ways that we completely disagree with. Yeah, Shoshana. I just wanted to, uh, in support of what Nancy said, the use of the term flip-flop mm. in political discourse, okay. it's always a criticism. It's right. always a negative. Right. Oh, this, this politician or other right. public figure changed their minds from, yes. from some previous yes. time. And it's always portrayed as a, a weakness, right. uh, if not worse. Yes, right, exactly, exactly. OK, so I want to give you another chain of being. And now maybe you'll understand why I've been hyping or harping on this other chain of being up here at the top. So I'm saying this may sound heretical. Well, let me put it this way. Let's start. Um, we have the rocks. We have the plant. Yes, that's true. We had our animals, our humans. They were deliberating. That was this level right here. Th this is, these deliberators can then send things to a legislative branch or start deliberating what the legislative branch set out. So in some ways, this group does the framing questions for us, the legislators. And then this group creates all the energy. Then we have our top deliberators. I'm actually a big fan of the Supreme Court. Um, Pat sent me a link to a C-SPAN, or told me about a C-SPAN interview, very recent, Justice Breyer, in which he, and I highly recommend finding that, Justice Breyer, just on C-SPAN. He says, the American public does not understand what it is we actually do. We get all these different arguments. We get briefs and briefs and briefs, and we're looking for good arguments. And we're only looking at cases that the American public needs to have decided. And we may not get it right. He's been, Breyer was on some big dissents, uh, Citizens United and Bush v. Gore. And still, he believes in the process because the advantage of being in the dissent is you get to make a great argument and then you don't actually have to deal with the enforcement piece. <laughs> if you've won, to a certain degree, you've lost. Because the truth will start to show all the problems in your decision. Whereas if you've written a dissent, you're getting some beautiful, beautiful arguments out there that people will perhaps use at a later time. So here they all are, and they are independent thinkers. They get here because they're independent thinkers. I know the Federalist Society is now like, ooh, we got another good one, we got another good one. But I'm going to play the game, and I'm going to say, by the most part, that they, um, they, uh, <laughs> they stay away from cameras. <laughs> 
That's the big controversy. Why aren't oral arguments on television? Justice Breyer says we do not want to have the television because that, you know how that works? People will take a little snippet. And why am I asking a question? I'm asking a question not because I know the answer, it's because I truly want to find out from the lawyers who are uh, litigating the case to give me, uh, to answer a question that I legitimately have. So the media, I don't mean to make it like a nasty media, but uh, it does seem that there's a major effort, or maybe it's this new kind of media, right, of like controversy, headlines. Did you see that Justice Breyer asked this question during this oral argument? That means tie him to a chair, tie him to a chair, we're all tied. Uh, he doesn't see it that way at all. So here we have our independent people, and they make their decisions, but they have to make it based on this. So that's God for me. This is where we go to try and resolve these issues, knowing that we are imperfect in our interpretation, but that's where we try and understand things. So Shoshana says, nobody understands flip, I mean, uh, and, and I'm not disagreeing with Shoshana. She pointed out how flip-flopping has become a pejorative term. So what does the Constitution offer us as a rebuttal? Amendments. Yes, and which amendment is so important if you're flip-flopping? Free speech. Absolutely. That's the biggest one. There's a reason it's number one. Free speech is something that is going to save us from people who say, oh, no, 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 I've got all the power and I'm going to make your decisions for you and this is going, I alone can take care of this and you all don't need to worry anymore. But if our response is, whoa, 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 whoa. I say this here, I'm going to try it out. And then I'm going to switch positions and I'm going to try it out here. Come on, bring it on, I don't care. Go ahead, give me a, give me a hard time. I want to try it over here, back and forth. Uh, yes, Bob. The flip-flopping issue, I, I just want to say, I think we remember Senator Jeffers and, and the decision made by our governor regarding major changes. And, you know, these folks have a certain courage that we will remember. Mm -hmm. I think it's very courageous mm -hmm. to go against the mainstream, against yes. some of the people who feel, boy, you're making a big mistake. But right. we will remember Senator Jeffers yes. for that. Yes. And yeah. also remember our governor for that. Right, you right. Know, yeah, did everybody hear Bob about, like, it, we actually want people to do that. I think, I think whoever said, I don't know if it was Lee, Leanne, did you, or somebody would say, like, when the person moved back and forth, that was the most exciting. That's us actually doing this work and not looking for how it's come across on our screens, which will frame it for us in a very specific way. Yeah. Um, that. Uh, we brought this up before, the term stare decisis, which means, uh, I take it to mean, as it has been, so it shall stay the same. And what scares me is my right to believe in one thing, and that is if I was to be put on the jury of a death penalty case, I would be not allowed to be on that jury because I'm against the death penalty. Mm -hmm. That takes away from my free speech, mm -hmm. but it also says stare decisis. Mm -hmm. So, as the United States has decided it's okay to have that penalty, then you are blocked from making a choice on that. So that's that's talking about um, if you're on a jury and you're in a certain state and there is a death penalty sentence and uh, and a jury is going to decide it, but you could get voted uh, to the voir dire, you might not be allowed on because you say you don't believe in it, right? So is that a way in which speech is limited because of the, t the technicalities? Absolutely, but so um, I am personally more worried that there's fewer juries in general than what's happening to the juries. This is, this is an enormous liberty that we are easily giving up. 95% of criminal cases are plea deals. And that means that citizens are not working it out. And, and because they're busy, I get it. If I get off jury duty, I think, yes, I won. Especially when it's a stupid case. I hate those civil suits. I've done terrible things. I, I, uh, uh, anyway, uh, there was a couple of times when I behaved badly because I really wanted to get off a jury. Because I had things to do. I had places to go. 
And yet, this is one of those key places. We have constitutional amendments giving people jury trials, right to jury trials. And if we give up on that, then we have just become, as Aristotle said, we want others to make our decisions for us. That's the hard piece here. Yeah, so I mean, that's why I see this chain of being as a very good chain of being as long as this level here is very active. Not legislators, not uh, Supreme Court justices, ordinary people getting together, wrestling with the decisions, working really, really hard, having a good clash, and being willing to say, okay, I, I, I want to change my mind. You've convinced me. But that's, I, that's where I see the work has to happen. And we all feel so animated. So it must be working. Nothing to worry. Yeah. Um, Pat. I've been thinking about this for a while now. I mean, I, I really like this good clash. Mm -hmm. But what about the time factor? Mm -hmm. If I was a pregnant woman, mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of months for you to work this out. Yes. Or, you know, in terms of guns, how many kids have to get killed while we're mm -hmm. deliberating? Right. Yeah, so Pat's question is around time is so crucial. Uh, like, if I was a pregnant woman, would I have time to go to these things? Can you get to the state house? No, uh, I mean, right. I'm not an abortion. Yeah. yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Right. You need to decide that. Right, right. Yeah, so there's also the time of laws can't get changed in the time frame that's necessary during that's urgency. Where the are yes. Time to, you know, just go through. Right. Um, oops, sorry. So, so the so, what is your suggestion? Like, I have, don't have a suggestion. This is just what I've been struggling with because I really like the whole deliberative right part. Of it. But I'm not going to need an abortion. And but I I do worry about kids and guns. I mean, how long is it going to take us yeah. to get those all of those for that? What we do? If this takes time. Yeah. Um, does anybody have a suggestion? So here's a, a reasonable question. You, you want, and, and I think it's very important to sp uh, focus on one specific issue. So if the issue is guns, prevalence of gun violence, prevalence of guns, so then that suggests we had better be having lots more of these kind of conversations across political factions. Mm -hmm. What I notice is that's too often the people who want to get rid of guns talk to the people who want to get rid of guns, and the people who are afraid that their guns are going to be taken away talk to the people who are afraid. So that needs to really get much, we, we need to find ways to just to do that. Um, yeah, and I've got lots of hands up. And you, I've, it's a J word, isn't it? Joseph, Joseph sorry. Yeah. yeah. Fingers, fingers. Uh, you know, time is, uh, is, is is, is about an individual mm -hmm. perspective. And we're in a community or society where there's many. So um, we favor change that's deliberative over change that's our I lived in a Sultan for three years. Wow. Um, I saw things happen very quickly. <coughs> Justice, not so much. Right. Yeah, so Joseph's point about this process that we're talking about takes time. A pregnancy could go to fruition. That's true. But compared to Joseph lived in a, a sultancy, things can happen very fast. So you can feel effective, but right. Uh, there was lots of hands up. Um, and I don't think, Julie, go ahead. I, I think it's very interesting the way New Zealand yeah. uh, yeah. acted so fast yes. uh, to change their laws in, in the aftermath of that, mm -hmm. that massacre. So Julie's talking about New Zealand, which is an interesting case because that was a top-down decision, wasn't it? Yes. So, and, and, and this is one of those things of like, yippee, somebody took care of the problem. We have the top-down. We still are going to figure out what the enforcement looks like and some of the details. So, and that's one of those things where we may want to concentrate power to get our will done, or are we going to go the slow road and not do so much? Yeah, Shauna's been waiting, and then Janice. That is an example of 
the emotion, the emotion of the moment. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it was the wrong thing to do. I thought she was very impressive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that was not deliberative. Uh, mm -hmm. It came out of the, the, the shock and horror yeah. and the, all the emotions of that event. Exactly. Not yeah. Did people. Did people hear what Shoshana said about that came out of a specific moment? It was a lot of shock. And, pe and oftentimes, those kind of laws, I I'm not very happy with them. Right, that, that was right. right. It's, it's like, uh, uh, and I, I think I mentioned in an earlier class, I was very strong with the Violence Against Women Act and wanted to put more offenders in jail and then wondered why I gave so much power to prosecutors. Yeah. When we have a problem that's pretty well documented of too much prosecutorial discretion leads to mass incarceration. Um, Janice. Yeah, I guess what I was thinking of was the ability of a charismatic leader to have, uh, and I'm not talking about our leader now, you know, many people think he is charismatic mm -hmm. in a different way, but the, um, the so-called leader, uh, the ability of a charismatic leader to read the people and what the people want and to act. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, the power of cultural change, um, as you explained, I mean, how the abortion laws changed yeah. to bring us to where we are, was a kind of cultural evolution mm -hmm. could evolve differently, um, similarly perhaps with guns or other issues. Yeah. Uh, and Right now, I think the influence of uh, television and movies in changing people's perception of mm -hmm. how to be mm -hmm. in our society, and yeah. that, I think, is overlooked. It's, it's power for good, and for good change. Oh, for good change? Yeah. Like tele change. using television? Well, like if you see a lot of uh, diverse families yes. on television right. you know, for several years, it's a right. popular show, and people kind of, I yeah. think that works to um, ameliorate the the negative stereotypes of people. Right, right. And, and what I'm hearing, so Janice is talking about, one is cultural change. How can you use cultural tools such as mass media to make some change? But then you also have the problem of television. Is that actually allowing us to do deliberation? No. Right? So it's not necessarily, I mean, it could. We talked at one class about what would it be like to televise these sort of debates and then send that out. And, and but it's changing public opinion. Yes. And perhaps be becoming more open and right. more informed. Right, right. And, and this is one where there's this idea, and I know this, like, if we have the right facts, and there was a bit of facts going on here with our deliberation, if we have the right set of facts, then we'll know what to do. And, and I think, not, don't get me wrong, I don't think facts are problematic. It's, I'm always interested in the exchange back and forth. And somebody going, oh, wow, that was a great point. Lynn, do you have your hand up? Yes. I'm struggling with, because I do believe in deliberation, but what if you're dealing with someone who's out and out buying? Yeah. yeah. So, you know what you can sell. Right, right. I, I, I don't know. What would you do? I don't know. You have to do it. You yeah. So you let them say whatever you want to say and then influence uh, uh, or or I don't know. And, right. And, and Joseph and Peter will have a, a response to that. Yeah. I, well, I think the judiciary is for that reason, for the times when we do step out of the bounds of the law and then we consider the case on a case by case situation. So Joseph is saying, you know, what do you do? Okay, first of all, here we have the deliberators, and somebody is, is not acting in good faith. They're, they're intentionally lying and saying things that aren't true. So then a law could get passed or it could go up the line. And so Joseph is saying, well, that's what the judiciary is supposed to do. As to ch and, and then the, the people at large are looking and saying, well, what kind of arguments are you making? Are they good constitutional arguments? Because we need to believe in you to have you have that, that space in the chain of being. So, that, so that, that's a, a place. And Peter had his hand up. Yeah. Just in terms of lying, it seems like the, uh, the gun industry has done a great job of preventing the government from collecting statistics on gun deaths. And so who's to know? So we right. don't know where the truth is or where somebody's lying. And that's an interesting one. So Peter's talking about the lack of statistics because the NRA basically told the CDC, right, the Center for Disease Control, you cannot do this kind of research. And then there started to be a backlash. Am I right? And so people started to say, okay, we need to start collecting this data. And the people at large said, wait a minute, you're telling us we can't have our facts? That's the whole reason we have our machines with us all the time. We got to have our facts. And so how can, you know, and the NRA seems to be running into some problems. So I guess I want to also say, 
I know this may sound very naive. I, am, I can't deal with environmental degradation, which may be messing up our chain of being in a very big way. But I do think that this system can still hold this chain of being. And on that, there was one other hand up. Was it Steve or Julie? I'm just stepping back a minute to Shoshana's comment. The opposite, uh, I'm trying to say the opposite number, no. Um, if you look at 9 11, yeah. and what happened after 9 11 in a yes. very emotional way, yes. and mm -hmm. laws were passed, yes. and very, very negative to it. Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, so Julie's talking about the Patriot Act. We can count when the deliberators are too afraid to deliberate. They just want somebody to do something so they don't have to deal with it anymore. That's when we make the worst laws, I think. The Patriot Act, some, uh, in my personal opinion, I think some of the sex offender laws that have been passed after horrific crimes, I, I, they are absolutely uh, they, they, are, they aren't constitutional. So I, oh, I just wanted to see if I got one more letter because I, I don't have my timepiece because I'm so far away from my, um, it's five to 12. I think it's a good time to see, oops, sorry, who else. I, I think this um, song of myself, mm -hmm. Walt Whitman, mm -hmm. um, might be very lovely if you're needing to start a, a morning ritual, perhaps instead of listening to morning edition, <laughs> perhaps instead of looking at your Twitter feed or Facebook, uh, may I recommend Leaves of Grass? I think he understood democracy as uh, Mark Edmondson, a professor at uh, University of Virginia, he's writing a book on Whitman and democracy. And he, and he says in, in an Atlantic article, Whitman told us how to feel about democracy. Mm. And that enthusiasm that you all had, that to me is the feeling of democracy. And when it's really, really good, it should shoot you all the way up the chain of being, <laughs> to God or the Constitution, whichever you want. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read the very beginning. Or actually, would somebody else wanna read? I know I'm mic'd, I don't have another mic. Read. Okay. Read I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. I loaf, and I just want that little shout out to Justice Douglas. Do you remember that? Yes. Ninth Amendment, the right to loaf. That's how he read that. Also the right to privacy, but the right to loaf. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health, begin hoping to cease, not until death. And that little line, my tongue, my every atom of blood, he's a plant, right? Giving seed to himself. Creeds and schools in abeyance. Retiring back a while, sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check, with original energy. Yeah, just say it, Hobbes, just say it. Just like Mary Alice did, just shout it out. <laughs> just say something and then stop. But and this other little piece about the atom in all of us, that's really big. There may not be as many factions as we are afraid of, if we can think of it on that level, so yeah. Joseph. And actually, what I was to read, looking on Whitman, he uh, wrote Leaves of Grass over 38 years. He kept editing it and revising it. Wow. And he was actually banned from federal, uh, one of the federal offices during the Civil War because he was considered, that was considered really out there. Yeah, yeah. So, so Whitman, it took him 38 years to write it? Yeah, and, and he was banned from federal buildings? 
Be because. Grace Johnson, one of them is from Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So, so he was banned from several jobs because of this kind. I mean, talk about incendiary work. It's not factional. It's not us against them. Probably the most radical thing you can do is to go up to the chain of being. This is a very divisive group. And even <laughs> angels, right? Angels are divided. But up here, this is all the one big thing. There is no division. That isn't to say we're all going to be singing Kumbaya all the time. But we got to be able to hit that moment in our consciousness, I think, and then go back to the clash. Yeah. And not just stay in our factions. Bob. Could you possibly like, read that one more time without stopping? Yes. Now. Yeah, and that's how we'll end. That'd be useful. OK. Thank you. Yes, perfect ending. I celebrate myself and sing myself. And what I assume, you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me, as good belongs to you. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air. Born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now 37 years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease, not till death. Creeds and schools in abeyance, retiring back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard. Nature without check with original energy. Thank you very much.